um, while we wait. Um, as I said, this is meant to be a uh, hands-on tutorial. So that means it, like you don't have to join, of course, but it'd be cool if you did. Um, and the pace will be expecting that you're joining in. Um, if you have problems, you can talk about it in chat. Probably the easiest would be to skip, share screenshots of your problems in chat. Um, I'll be using the nano text editor, so why don't we uh, just explore that real quick. Nano is nice because, as you can see, all of the uh, shortcuts are listed at the bottom, but my screen has uh, the main two that we'll be worrying about also on it. Uh, so let's just type out testing, testing, one, two, three, one, two, four. <laughs> Uh, and so I'm going to do control O. It's going to be confirming at the bottom that I want to write to this file name that I opened with nano. I'll click enter. Voila, it wrote it. Now I'll do control X to exit. Very simple. If we do ls, which means list the directory, you'll see that among all the files in this directory, we have test.txt. Okay, so I'm going to remove all the hello stuff because we're just going to start from the beginning. I'll assume that everyone is here who would like to be here. So. Let's get started. Here, let me remove this hello as well. All right. So what we're going to be doing is using Nano to write programs, and we're going to be using G-Fortran to compile programs. Um, I already mentioned in the initial message about the seminar to kind of get your environment ready. Um, if you haven't, there probably isn't time to do that now. So let's get started. Uh, we are going to cover first, we're going to just do a very basic program. After that, we will I uh, cover the actual structure of a program. But the biggest thing is that you have to write program and then a title, which I'll call Hello World. And it's good practice to always uh, put end program Hello World right after, just so that you don't forget to write it. Every program has to end with this end program. And optionally, you can put the title of the program again. I always decide to put the title of the program. And we are going to illustrate a couple things here. First is that printing is just as easy as doing this. And hello world. So you do print the star means that you write to default output, which uh, for all intents and purposes is the command line. And then you put whatever you want to print. So let's just try that. We'll do control O to save. We'll press enter and we'll exit with control X. Now we'll do LS to confirm that the hello is there. It is. So everyone should have G-Fortran installed. We write G-Fortran. We do hello F90. And I'm going to do dash O. That means what do I want the output to be named? And I'll put um, 
hello.exe. If we do ls, we can confirm it's there. My uh, terminal even highlights it in green to illustrate that it's an executable. To execute it, um, I will be doing hello.exe with a dot slash at the beginning. You can see that here. Voila, hello world. Easy as pie. So, um, now let's go back into the program, and I'm going to illustrate one thing while we're doing this, which is that you can also add uh, multiple different statements. So I'm going to do 2 plus 2 equals, and here we're just going to put 2 plus 2. So you put a comma, that means that whatever this output is, it'll be uh, right after this equal sign. So now I'm going to save, like we've learned how to do, exit. Um, if you press up on your terminal, you can typically get back to previous commands. So let's do that. And let's execute hello.exe again. And we have the answer. Hello world, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Great. Probably easy enough to follow along. Okay. So now, uh, is everyone hearing a weird dinging on my end? I hope the answer is no, because I'm pretty sure I've blocked out those sounds. Great. Good to know. Good to know that my muting of the dinging has worked for you guys. OK. Let's clear. Clear is another command. It just clears up the commands you've written on the command line so far. What we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to make a new file, structure. In that, we're going to talk about the structure of a Fortran program. Structure of Fortran program. N program. Structure of Fortran program. So here I'm going to outline the basic structure. By the way, You know, that is an excellent idea. Okay, so comments start with an exclamation mark. Exclamation. The exclamation mark I just wrote might not be visible, but it's there. So first, libraries. Now that I'm done writing these comments, they'll disappear. So first we do the libraries. For example, use uh, one thing that I've been using lately is a library called CUDA4 for CUDA Fortran. Uh, that isn't something that you guys will be able to compile. Uh, we're not going to use any of the libraries that we actually uh, use today. So I'll just put in this library. Uh, what this allows us to do is um, more easily call C programs if we need it. But you don't have to worry about it. I'm just illustrating the usage of how to use libraries. So this is how to load libraries. 
These, this is what typically goes at the top of a program or a module. We'll talk about modules later. Next. Next on a typical Fortran program are uh, <clears throat> statements for the rest of the program. Of the program. So what I mean is I can put in this statement, implicit none. To, to illustrate that this is supposed to be a comment, I'll put dashes, and then when I'm done with them, I'll put exclamation marks. So implicit none. What does this do? Hmm. Yeah, that doesn't work anymore. Okay. What implicit none does is it tells the compiler to not assume the types of variables. So uh, this means that we have to type out the type of every variable. If we didn't have this, then our programs could be like kind of similar to Python. Similar to Python because the program will assume the types of variables. Uh, but most Fortran programmers put the statement implicit none because they want control over the types of variables. So now that I'm done with that, Let's comment these out. Uh, I've already told you guys, so you don't need to see these comments. Next is we define program variables. So here's some examples. Um, we start, you don't have to, but this is what I've been leaning towards in terms of good programming practice. We start with defining constants. So what is the syntax for that? Let's start with integers. This, you list the type, and for constants, you also put parameter. 2 equals 2. So this is the syntax for making a variable called 2, which has an integer typing. Parameter means that it's a constant. And for these constants, we have to initialize them immediately. So I set this equal to the integer 2. Can everyone see this too? Is this red visible? Okay, great. And yes, NASA, this will be recorded. Okay, so there are a couple other constants that we might want to put in like a typical physics program. So the single precision variables are called real. Parameter pi equals 3.14159. We might want to initialize that. And another thing that I've found useful in initializing is i. So here we're going to actually have to specify that i is a complex number what we're putting here. What this CMPLX does is it takes two, uh, two numbers and it sets, it creates a complex number. Uh, 
you know i is the imaginary part so it is the imaginary number so i equals zero times a real number plus one times i makes sense so those are all the constants i'll do for this program next we'll do variables so we might want to just do integer result of 2 plus 2. So the difference is that you don't put the parameter title into this variable. That way the program knows that this is allowed to change. You can initialize it if you want, but uh, we're not going to. Um, we can do a couple other things. Here is how you declare a vector or array. So real dimension two vec2. And so what this is, is it's a vector with two elements. We'll, we'll show some examples of actually accessing it later. We can also declare an array. I'm going to illustrate two things here. So here I've declared an array that's a two by two. Yes. Structure F90, bright green. All right, thank you, Cronum. <laughs> Beautiful. Shout out to Cronum. Okay. So. Um, what I've done here is two things. I've made a 2x2 two two array. This dimension. This is the size of the first dimension. And this is the size of the second dimension. Fairly obvious, I think. And is, let's say, n by m, we chose n equals m equals 2. Second, you'll notice I didn't just write the number 2 here, I wrote the word 2. And we're allowed to do that because we put this up here as a parameter. So, I'm going to exit out of here and try compiling this just so that we know that everything's correct syntax so far. It all should be. The Fortran structure.f90 struct.exe seems to compile. Nothing happens because we haven't told it to print anything out to screen, but it all works. Okay. Now, uh, how I've normally been making programs is next we um, declare arrays with unknown dimensions at compile time. So what that means is we might not know that the arrays we need in our program are two by two. So what we do is let's even make it complex. Complex dimension 
for unknown, we put colons. And we put the word allocatable. And I'll just call this phi. So I'm putting this at the end after the rest of our variables because the next thing we're going to start is we're done declaring the variables. And now let's now let's initialize variables. So here it's a complex array in say X, Y, Z directions, or, you know, just a, a 3D array. And allocatable means that we don't know the size, but we will allocate the size during the program. Now, here is where we're going to allocate. The syntax is, we do allocate phi, and we put the dimensions, each of these three dimensions. We can do two, four, eight. This will allocate an array that's two by four by eight. So it's not really an array anymore. You can think of it as a tensor if you like. And yes, Jacob is calling Chronum Hacker Man, I see. So this allocates this phi array. Now, obviously, I just told you we do allocatable when we don't know what the dimensions of the array will be. So these numbers could be user input. Um, I'll talk about user input a bit later. So we won't be doing that yet. And now we're finally done initializing. We're done declaring. Uh, so let's go to the main part of the program. So here, I'll save periodically. So control O, save. We can scroll up. Sorry. Um, and we can see all the variables we've we've made. Uh, so there are a couple of things we haven't done yet. We haven't uh, accessed this vec2 array. So what we're going to do is we're going to show how to access array elements. You just put the parentheses. The first element of vec2 is 2. And the second element is also equal to 2. So we could then have result of 2 plus 2 equals the sum of vec2, the elements in vec2. So what am I doing here? Sum is a Fortran intrinsic function. That means, you know, it'll, it, it's there no matter what. In C, there isn't an intrinsic sum function because, you know, you don't, I don't know, the, the C creators don't like us for some reason. Okay. However, we can do this initialization another way. I'm going to comment this out. And I'm going to say vec2 colon equals 2. And what this will do is it will set all the elements of vec2 to 2. Now, I don't have to use the word 2. I can use the number 2. I'm just illustrating that we declared this to parameter earlier. And just to confirm, 
let's pause for a moment and let's do let's print out this result I'm going to save I'm going to exit and let's compile it as a reminder this is how you do it and let's run it four awesome so everything's dandy so far We can do a few other things in our program. We can initialize this array. Um, trying to remember yet. Yeah, array two by two is what it's called. Array two by two. We can set this equal to pi if we want. We could set, sorry. Technically, this syntax is correct, but I find it more readable to always remind anyone reading the code that this is a two by two array and we're setting all of the elements to pi. And phi, maybe we initialize it as this complex number i. So let's pause and Let's even see what happens when we decide to print out these arrays. So let's print these out. Array two by two. By array. By. I'm actually going to make the text a little bit smaller. Oh. It's not what I meant to do, but all right. That's fine. OK, so let's save. We'll quit. I'll press up. I'll do this again. I'll press up. And we'll do this again. All right, so there's a bunch of garbage on the screen. If we scroll up, we see that the two by two array was printed as a sequence of four numbers, all equal to pi. Uh, well, all equal to pi up to the precision that we set it to. And you can see for the phi array, that we have a sequence of complex numbers printed out. These parentheses are encasing the complex number. And we have 0 plus 1i. And we have a sequence of them. So, not the prettiest thing on the screen. We can use clear to clear that up. But we can print out arrays. It's, it's pretty helpful. Now I'm going to comment out, actually, before we do that, I'm going to allocate this to be a two by two by one array, because I'm going to illustrate that we can even do things like phi equals Uh, sorry, the dimensions of that won't work. Let's do array two by two equals matmol array two by two, array two by two. Let's not print out the phi array anymore. What I'm going to illustrate is that this is the matmol Fortran intrinsic. No more do you have to write your own procedure for it. So if we print out this array two by two, so we go up, we recompile, 
and we execute. All four of these numbers are the result of this pi array multiplying itself. Any questions so far? Ah, why? Yours looks better. All right. So I've illustrated so far a fair amount of useful things, I think, uh, that people can do in Fortran. So let's go to a new, a new program. Um, LS, we have these things. Let's make a new program. We'll call it constructs.f90. And I'm going to use this program to illustrate some simple constructs. Sorry, end program. Program simple constructs. So let's um, declare implicit none. As I said, Fortran will assume types of your variables during compile time if you don't put this. But I always put it personally. If I wanted the, the language to assume types, I would just use Python. Um, so let's make a couple parameters. Three equals three. And let's even make a logical parameter. E equals dot true. To be honest, Nano isn't highlighting it, which is making me suspicious. That would be quite a shame if, if so. All right, Nano just doesn't know. Let's just go with this. Yeah, you don't need things. So a lot of old Fortran programs have all caps, which is really grating on the eyes to read. So I'm gonna illustrate a couple things. As I mentioned, these are the constants. Now let's go with some variables. For example, we're going to talk about loops, so I declare a loop index. And now let's go to the main part of our program. Okay. So let's do if T equals true, then, and let's make the end if directly. Starting loop, do loop index equals, so here I'm illustrating, here, before I go too quickly, this is a comment, so you can ignore it for now. Uh, this, is an, this is the form of an if construct. You have if, then,
and you can have an else not starting loop. And what I've done in this parentheses here is um, Fortran has a command for testing the if two things are equal. We've declared a constant t which is equal to true. So this uh, logical expression should yield uh, true, which means this part of the if statement will execute. Else will print not starting loop. Okay. Vim highlights it, Vi. Okay. Good to know. Okay, so now let's put in what we want to happen if our parameter equals true. So here we can start the loop index at any anything we want. Let's start it at one and we'll go up to five. I always find it helpful to always end my statements. And now we can do something like print loop index loop index. Okay, this was a lot, so let's exit out. I already did control O to save, control X to exit. I'll do dash O, and I'll just do test.exe. Ah, so here, the Fortran uh, compiler is telling me that logicals need to be compared with dot equivalent instead of dot equals. Very helpful. So now we can go down and we can put that V in here. And we'll exit. We'll try compiling. We'll try running. And voila. Very simple stuff. Okay. So now let me illustrate a couple things. We can actually can actually name constructs. What do I mean by that? Test uh, equivalence. We can actually at the beginning of if and do and other constructs, we can put a name test equivalence here is perhaps a you know obvious name but there are cases where your if statement will be more complicated and you might want to have a simple name to tell people what's going on so we can name this if construct Okay, so I just named this if construct. Let's confirm that this compiles. All right, it compiles. You run it. Same thing happened. Great. So why, why do this? Well, you can do this because this is evidence of a of self-documenting code. Instead of having to write comments, if your code has these things like these named constructs, you can just read the code and get everything you need from the code without having to write, you know, additional comments. So both if and do are constructs and so we can also name our do loop 
So let's do Yes. Let me show you. So I'm actually going to show you an example right now of an actual practical use. Uh, so loop index 2. So everyone go up. Sorry, everyone go up to our variable uh, declarations and let's do a comma here. You can declare multiple variables on the same line, uh, which I normally do when the variables are very similar or very related, um, such as this loop index and loop index 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a nested do loop. So we're going to name the second loop. Loop index equals, let's say, negative 5 to negative 1. And let's do an end do second loop here. And what I'm going to do is, well, we'll, we'll do something with the loop indices, like loop index plus loop index two, cumulative loop index. What we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of the fact that we've named these loops. So if loop index 2 is more than negative 2, then we are going to do something called cycle. Cycle first loop. Else, do this, and we'll have to put the end if here. So I think it's best to just illustrate what happens. Uh, for illustration purposes, I'm just going to print out both loop indices actually, both loop indices. Okay. So for this print statement, we expect um, loop index and loop index two to print one through five and negative five to negative one. Uh, so it's, by the way, the looping is start and then end. And you can look up for yourself the other options because there are other options to doing do loops, just like there are other options for doing for loops. Anyways, let's illustrate the behavior of this. Let's compile and let's run. So you'll note something. We start with 1, negative 5, 1, negative 4, 1, negative 3, etc., etc. But then we get 1, negative 2. And what happens? We don't print out the negative 1 that the second loop index is supposed to become. Instead, we started the outer loop again. The inner loop was cut short, whereas we started the outer loop. Now that's because of that if statement. But this doesn't happen just once. You'll see negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, and then when our if condition was met, we cycled 
to the next outer loop. Am I not, uh, am I not audible anymore? Okay. All right, the, the chat seemed to not be hearing me. Okay, okay. Yes, Flynn, it's similar to break, except, Whereas break will break you out of the current construct, cycle, you'll notice we put the name of the loop that we wanted to actually start the next cycle of. So this is actually more powerful than continue or break statements. Because we can actually go back, like, out of multiple loops. We could do a third loop and put this statement in here, and it would cycle through the first loop still, because we put the name of the loop. Yeah, exactly, Flynn. We could, we could, uh, if we wanted to, we could cycle the second loop. Um, or we could have, as I said, a third loop, either outside or inside, that we, we cycle through. So I encourage you to, to experiment with this, because it's pretty cool. Um, now, in like C or C++, uh, you'd need, like more complicated if then logic to do this you need to like put multiple if statements you need to bloat your code basically yeah it is actually really neat we can even i'll just illustrate another if we if we do negative four instead, then this will execute more. And so let's illustrate that. The output is a lot smaller because the inner loop is only printing out negative five, negative four, etc. Yep. So this is uh, I was it was it Jacob that was asking um, yeah. yeah so this is one of the practical uses of naming your loops which I think is really cool okay what else um, I have some sticky notes okay let's continue this example but let's um, enhance this example with another construct. Let's use the associate construct. So the syntax is like this, associate loop index two, we make a little arrow out of an equal sign and a greater than sign, and we do a new name for it. I'll put, I'll name it inner index. And let's do end associate. So to make it more visible, let's increase the spacing of everything. One reason I like Emacs is that uh, it'll indent appropriately, and it'll make changing the indents very easy. But I'm sure Vim and other editors do that too. So what does this associate do? Um, basically, it's there to make code more readable. So instead of loop index 2, 
we're going to call this inner index. We're going to replace what we were using loop index 2 for with inner index. So all this does is it temporarily renames or it you declare a temporary variable whose entire purpose is to be a new name for this variable. So to illustrate the functionality, I'll replace all mentions of loop index two with inner index. Let's compile it. Hmm. I apparently have incorrect syntax here. Okay, let's um, I believe I actually got this reversed. Um, so these associate variables are not true variables. Um, they're just here to make uh, your code a bit more readable in certain parts of it. Um, so you don't need to, to declare them because all the compiler is going to do is it's going to replace any mention of inner index with this loop index too. So let's try this. I think I just had it reversed. Yeah, I just had it reversed. It compiles correctly now. If we test it, we get the same uh, functionality as before. Voila. So this one, Jacob, is completely just for code readability. Um, so to, to comment out the um, usage, you do new name points to variable. Uh, let's put even current variable. So you can do a couple more things with associate. You can actually have this variable point to or, or be the name new name of like an element of an array. There are some fancier things you can do with associate, but I won't go into those now because to be honest, I haven't really used them in my code so far. Uh, but you can imagine, like say you have a code with a lot of different files and you're not sure what a particular variable actually means, uh, you can give it another name temporarily to tell anyone who's reading your code like in more detail what's going on. So for example, you might not want to use a long name of, you might not want to use a long name like this throughout your entire code, but you know, maybe you want to use a descriptive name in a certain routine. You could, you could do that. I think I've belabored the point enough. So the other thing is I'll do two other things in the context of this example. We're going to illustrate the else if. Oh, right. And I, I'm just going to make this shorter again. That was for illustration purposes. Else if inner index is greater than negative three, then let's actually exit the first loop. So cycle will just go to the next iteration 
of the first loop. But exit will actually exit that loop entirely. So exit is like break. But you can exit a specific loop. Exit specific loop. And cycle is more like continue. So here I've illustrated both the else if and the exit commands. Let's see what happens. Voila! Only the uh, only three actions happen because once negative three turns to negative two for this second loop index, it said exit the first loop, and so this first loop never even updated. You can imagine how this might be useful uh, in your given you know, code of choice. And as a reminder, this is uh, what it looked like. These are all useful commands for if you have nested loops, nested, nested. Um, yeah, nested loops. For example, for those of you doing like condensed matter physics, you might be doing an integral where you only want to consider values near the Fermi surface. So you only want to consider some energies of a quantity that are near uh, the Fermi energy. And, you know, you might be doing some if-then checking to check if the energy that you're currently on is near the Fermi energy. And if it isn't, you might want to cycle one of your nested loops. All right. Let's move on. I have a sticky note with a bunch of different things that I'm covering. Okay, let's talk about subroutines and functions and modules. Okay, so I'm going to do something. I'm going to make a modules directory. And I'm going to create a modules file that I'll call helpful modules or helpful mod.f90. And so a module is a separate file where you only, uh, it, it's a separate file intended to be included in a main program file. Modules um, have a initialization index like this, helper mod and module. And so these can have can have similar structures to program files. Uh, they can have, they can declare variables, uh, etc. So this is, let me show you how we will use modules. We can have variables such as module integer. Um, we might only need we may only need 
a particular parameter um, contained within a particular module. For example, I've had it where I only worked with complex numbers inside a particular module. And so I would declare this I in a particular module instead of my main program. Here's where modules uh, shine. Uh, modules contain things. Sorry, this is wrong syntax. It's end helper. It's end module helper module. So contains. What does contains mean? Uh, this is where we write functions and subroutines. So I'm going to write down a function. A function is a um, A function takes in variables and returns an output without modifying any other part of the program. So this is what a function is supposed to be. Function my sign of x and we do result my sign and let's always end um our you see fortran has a particular uh, notation you declare something and then you end its definition somewhere. So what is this going to do? This is going to take in a real, it could be complex if we wanted, but let's stick with real, intent in x. So what this is saying is that this parameter as the intention of being an input. Now, result, we've named what our result is going to be of this function. And so we need to declare what type we want this result to be. Um, we don't need to put an intent for this because it's already up in this result specifier. And all we need to do is here, I'm going to even put in some helpful comments, input slash output. And now main. I've been using the word main to mean after I've initialized everything, after I've declared all my variables, etc. I'm going to put my sign equals sign of x. And we can end the function because we've uh, we've assigned, you know, the result, a value. Now, sign is an inbuilt function in Fortran. So sign is inbuilt in Fortran. But something that you might want to do is at the top of modules, you might want to declare that you're using an intrinsic function, such as sign. So this is optional. And the idea is that users may be using external or programmers might be using external libraries 
that have particular sine, you know, cosine, etc. And this is kind of something that just tells a reader of a program that we're using the intrinsic Fortran function. That's all. And I'm actually going to make sure these are indented. Okay. So now I'm going to write out an equivalent uh, subroutine. So subroutine, my sign, but subroutine, I'm going to have x, my sign, here. And we end subroutine, my sign, sub. OK, Flynn. Intent in, um, intent in is for readability. I'm going to go with Cronum's uh, attitude. You should write intent in for all your input variables. <laughs> Funny, Jacob. Oh yes, you're right. I did I did I did miss it. Thank you. This is also optional to end your functions with the name, but it is you should do this. Because the thing is your functions, your subroutines are gonna be large. And you might not want to be scrolling up every time to make sure that you're like in the correct subroutine, that you're modifying the correct one. So a subroutine can achieve the same task as a function. Real intent in x. But now, all the subroutine knows is that you're passing it two variables, x and my sign. And so you have to actually declare the intent of my sign now. So we can, you know, uh, it's good practice to, you know, just put some things in your program that separate the variable declaration and initialization from the main part of your program. So now we do the same thing. My sign equals sine of x. And it seems like these are the same thing, right? Well, they're different. So for a function, for a function, a user will pass in only one variable or only input variables user passes in only input variables for a subroutine user passes in both input and output variables It seems like a trivial difference until you realize one thing. Uh, this function creates a new, or let's see, it allocates new memory every time it is called. So let's imagine that instead of one sign, so instead of like one X, we had X's 
and we had my signs. We can put in the dimensionality here, and we put in an arbitrary dimensionality indicated by colon because every array in Fortran carries the information about its size with it. So the compiler and the program will know how much memory to allocate when it's passed in an array like this. And let's make the output an array as well. Dimension. Um, for a function, we have to, since um, the size of this x's is passed, um, we can declare an arbitrary size for the x's input. However, since functions allocate new memory every time, uh, for the output, we have to declare this to be an allocatable um, array. And we'll put it as my signs. And so here, we will do, well, we'll do a couple things. So, integer size of x. In our main function, we're going to put size of x equals size of x's. So we'll, we'll rename this to size of x's. We'll allocate my signs to be the size of size of x's. And we can achieve this function in two ways. All right, sounds good. Okay, so what I've done is I've changed uh, the input x's to have uh, to be an array, a one-dimensional array, and my output, my desired output, is also going to be a one-dimensional array. The idea is we're going to pass in a bunch of different x variables and output a bunch of different sign, sign variables. Um, so I made an integer being the size of x's. We're actually going to make another integer called loop variable. To quote Cronum, why are we like this? <laughs> true, true. So here we get the size of our input array, we allocate the output, and now we're going to make a do loop. So loop var equals one to size of x's, and we're going to do sign my signs of loop variable equals sign of x's of loop variable. Let's do some indenting and end do. So we'll do assign output as the name of this do loop. Now, uh, I've added some spaces to make this look pretty. But we can do a couple things to, you know, make it look better. For example, we can use the associate construct. Associate x x's loop there. And end associate. So what that allows us to do is change this from, you know, sign of, you know, x's of accessing an array to just sign of x. 
So this associate construct has, you know, allowed us to not use this long variable name here. It's helpful when we're doing more than just one line with with X, but you know it's it's got its uses. Okay. So why don't we actually make something that uses uh, this this function? So we're going to save this module so far. And we're going to make a program called function and subroutine the f90 so function underscore subroutine dot f90 we're going to make our program we'll just call it example function subroutine if the internet keeps bugging out now all I can say is uh, kill Comcast. Bring them much violence. So yeah, as as uh, Jacob was saying, uh, you can actually use associate like in more contexts. You can rename multiple things at once. Yeah, as Flynn is saying, you can assign expressions. Uh, it's interesting, and I encourage you guys to uh, to explore it. Okay, let's. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the module that we made, so let me. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, I had been working on this function. My sign with X's as inputs and the result being my signs. Uh, array inputs, allocatable array. I had two integers. And what I had done is I had associated this X with uh, this array element. That way we can have a uh, nice assignment line. Uh, so yeah, this is this is what I had been working on before uh, it cut out again. Okay, got it. Cool. So I had done this associate so that we could, uh, yeah, do this. We could even associate X with like the sign of X's loop there, but you know we're not we're not going to do that here. But as people were saying, as Jacob was saying, you can assign. Or as Flynn was saying, you can assign expressions. You can do more complicated things. Okay. Yes, and we're going to illustrate that here. So not only do we have to uh, 
use the syntax for libraries, but libraries and modules are being used are declared here. So as Jacob is saying, when we want to compile a program that uses both a main program file and a module file, we have to compile both the module and whatever main program we're using. So module test.exe. Hmm. Let's see, there's some syntax errors, it appears. Expected block name of assign output and end do. Let's change that. End do assign output. Uh, let's see if that fixes it. It did. So unfortunately, Fortran, uh, sometimes the error messages can be confusing. Uh, but here's a learning experience. Um, if you have a bunch of errors, scroll all the way to the top and fix the first thing that you see. Uh, and that will often fix everything else, or at least it'll fix multiple things. All of these errors kind of come from the fact that this first error made the compiler confused. So to, to summarize this part, this part had to be changed. You had to start the name of the do loop and end with the name of the do loop. All right, cool. So all I did here was declare the program and then say that I wanted to use this module. Mm -hmm. Now we're actually gonna write some more stuff in this program. So let's declare dimension, say, 100 x's. Variables to be used. And let's start the program. Yes, use is like import or using, and very good point, Flynn. Very good point. So, to improve even more code readability, you can do only my sign. What this tells uh, the compiler is that this main function is only going to use the function my sign that we created in this helper module. So this is the syntax for that. And I believe we can even do multiple at the same time. Uh, so why don't I try compiling this just to make sure. Generic specification and use statement. OK. 
Maybe this isn't the syntax. For train use only. Let's. Let's explore different possible syntaxes. Apparently that works. Okay, everyone. Huzzah! This is the syntax. Okay. So what we're going to do is we want an integer x index. And what we're going to do is we're going to do x index equals 1 to 100 since our array is of that size and oh is my cursor that big that's pretty funny oh well don't worry <laughs> we don't use cursors uh in Linux anyway. So I'll name this assign X's assign X's and we're gonna make sure that our domain is specified. We'll just do X index times 0 0.1 something like that. And now, we also want sine of x's to be a variable, because we're going to compute the sine of x's using the function that we made in our module. So sine of x's should equal mine sine of x's. And then, we can print sine of x's. Pause for a moment. Okay. Let's try compiling this. It compiled. And let's try executing it. All right, in very pretty fashion, we uh, we have computed the sine of x for a bunch of different x's. Okay, so our module works. Our module function works. Um. So, I've illustrated that we can define functions in modules and subroutines in modules. Let's go to our modules function. Here, what we did is we called this function my sign of x's result my signs. We are going to do something different. We're going to rewrite this function in a simpler way. Okay. So we are going to rewrite this function in its entirety in a simpler way. So I'm going to do this to illustrate the power of Fortran. I believe this, what I'm about to show, shares uh, functionality with MATLAB. We're going to write an elemental function 
my sine 2 of x result my sine. And we do end function my sine 2. So Elemental specifies that the input may be an array or a scalar. However, all we have to do is act like the input is a scalar. And all we have to do is declare my sign equals sine of x. So from what I remember, this should work on both scalar x variables and array variables of x. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by broadcasting, Flynn, but let's try it out. So we have this. Let's go to our func sub, and we're going to do my sine 2. Uh, just for readability, we're only going to have this array have five elements in it. Yeah, Vi, that, uh, so I'm going to go through a, uh, that way as well. So let's do sine of x's equals my sine 2 of x's, and we'll print this again. Ah, okay. Um, so I believe it's similar to broadcasting, yes. So I added these two lines. I changed the size, or I'm changing the size of the array here. And in fact, let's be smart about this. Let's do integer parameter array size equals five or five this is a good programming practice instead of hard if you're going to use a constant size array declare a parameter for it instead of just writing the you know five everywhere that way you can change the parameter with just one line instead of multiple. Okay, so let's compile, let's execute, and as you can see, they both output the same thing. Now, as Vi was saying, we can actually do this a third way. So here, we've got one way, I sign two, we've got another way, function I sign three of x, result my sign will be another way, and function I sign three. Real intent in. X. Real dimension law. Uh, sorry, allocatable. My sign. And instead of X, X will do X's. 
And so we still need to uh, allocate this my sign. So we need, let's do, let, let's put in some helpful comments, input slash output, output, uh, local variables. So integer size of X's. And now the main part of the function size of x's equals size of x's. Let's allocate my sign size of x's. And now, as Vi was saying in this function, we could just do my sign colon equals sign of x's. Thank you. As Vi was saying, instead of writing out the do loop, we could do this. Oh, uh. Now, Vi, the reason we can do this is because in Fortran, in Fortran, the intrinsic sign of X function is declared elemental. So the reason we can write a function my sign with this syntax is because, it, well, here we're passing an array to sign the intrinsic Fortran sine of X. But all that's doing is that is now calling basically an elemental function called sine of X. Yeah, exactly, Flynn. The idea with elemental here is that, you know, you can make new functions that can happen both with scalars and element by element for arrays. And you can do that with, uh, even if like the set of operations you do to the input is very complicated. Okay. We've, we've gotten past, or we've, we've gotten through all this. Now, one thing, and here I'll focus on my sign three here, is that this, sorry for the typos, this function allocates this memory again and again. That, what I mean is that if we were to call this function multiple times, we would allocate this we would reallocate this every time. Now, that's a problem if our arrays are really large. Because then al the time it takes to allocate them is quite large. We have, in Fortran, there are a couple ways to deal with this. But the way I typically use is to rewrite this as a subroutine. So a subroutine has the user pass in the array or the variable um, where the user has already allocated the necessary memory. So that instead of the instead of a function reallocating memory again and again, we have the user of this subroutine 
allocating the memory for my sign once and then just passing that in so you don't allocate the memory again and again. Now for those of you who've only used like Python, Python does this all the time. It reallocates memory again and again all the time for uh, variables. If you use NumPy, you have to use a specific uh, command to make NumPy use your pre-allocated uh, memory. Anyways, let's do this here. Let's rename this x to be x's. And um, we declare this to be an arbitrary dimensionality and an arbitrary dimensionality. And as a reminder, for subroutines, we have to declare the intention uh, of the output. By we have to, I mean you should. Not that the compiler will complain necessarily, but you should. And so now, Let's just, you know, write this as simply as we can. Let's save it. And the subroutine now, you'll notice we did not allocate. We did not put allocatable and we did not allocate this memory. That's because when we go to our uh, func sub, program. First we have to use my sign sub. For a subroutine, for a subroutine, we have to call it. So call my sign sub will pass in the x's and sign of x's arrays. And just to make sure uh, our program is actually changing the sign of x's array, we'll make sure to reinitialize it to be zero here. But yeah. So we call a subroutine, we pass in the input array in this case, and the output array that we've already created. And when we save and compile this, and we run it, you'll see we get the same output as before. Okay, so, so one reason to use subroutines is to, to not reallocate memory every time for big arrays. That's one reason. Um, and now let's talk about another reason. Um, so let's save. Let's go back to our modules file. And let's talk about subroutines. Okay, so in subroutines, we are allowed to modify 
things other than the output variable. What do I mean by that? I mean, let's say now, uh, now that we've printed this uh, my sign function, um, we might want to print out that we've succeeded. So print succeeded in the subroutine. What this print statement does is it modifies the state of the command line. Not only are we changing the output here, but we're modifying the state of the command line. So we're allowed to do that in subroutines, but we're not necessarily allowed to do that in functions. The compiler will allow us to also print things in functions. But the proper practice is to do the following. Proper practice for functions is to always use the pure modifier and never change state of the program. So I'm going to add something called the pure modifier here. And now I'm going to try and print something. Finished the function. Every time you write a function, you should write pure. The idea is you give an input and you get out outputs. Subroutines can do more than that. So there, there is no equivalent statement for subroutines about being pure or being elemental, things like that. So let's try compiling this and it's not going to work. It's not going to work because we've specified this function to be pure. Now, uh, you might say, but Slender, I, don't, I want my program to compile. Why did we put pure? So, pure tells the compiler that the function is safe, meaning it doesn't do anything unexpected for a function. And this allows the compiler to do certain optimizations that subroutines and non-pure functions can't do. So this is something more important for like scientific computing, which I assume is what we're all here for. When you declare a function to be pure, you're saying the function is safe, meaning the function won't do any illegal changes of state to so like the command line by printing out things or by changing you know other variables that you might pass in things like that um, so the compiler can make certain optimizations to make things faster so i'm going to delete this line where i print out something but you'll notice when we go back and we try recompiling it works and now we can print and succeeded in the subroutine. Voila. So 
So as a as a comment, use functions for small tasks where you just want input to output. Use subroutines for when you, for big tasks. That may also change more things than just, you know, computing f of x. So big tasks that reuse allocated memory and subroutines may also change more things than just computing f of x. So that's kind of the, the heuristic for when to use functions versus subroutines. Uh, does anyone have questions about that? Okay, I will take that as a no. Okay, so let's talk about generic programming. We're going to modify, we're going to continue to modify this helpful module right here. And we're going to talk about generic programming. So what if we wanted to call the same function for sine of x regardless of the type of x? So if we scroll back down to our functions, You'll see we had to declare these x's to be real. But, you know, what if we wanted them to be complex? Right? Well, you know, in programs like Python, or in languages like Python, maybe Julia, I'm not too familiar with Julia. Uh, if you're to call, you know, sine of x, it'll do it for you, right? And in Fortran, I believe it'll also do it for you, like just real, complex, whatever. It'll compute the sine of x. Um, but if we had other operations that we wanted to do that weren't intrinsic to Fortran, uh, like if we wanted to add a different number to each element of an array, uh, we'd have to make our own function or subroutine for that. And we'd have to specify the input and output. So let's say we want to call the same function, whether this x input is real or complex, and whether or not the output we want is real or complex. So what we do is we type in interface my sign of x or sorry I believe this is right actually I wasn't expecting to get this far to be honest interface Fortran the idea is the end interface so in the interface we're going to write uh, 
an interface for this my sign of x where we tell it to call different programs depending on the input and output that we give it. So function my sign real of x um, and n function my sign real of x. Exactly, Flynn. This is for those of you familiar with it, this is function overloading. So all we do with this interface is we specify the, whether it's a function or subroutine, we specify the, uh, we have to put in result, I sign, intent in X, and real my sign. We don't actually put the rest of the function in here. We just put the input and output. Now, let's do my sign complex of x result my sign the end function. And now we're going to do complex intent in x complex my sign now if this works then when we change our main function our main program func sub.f90 we'll be able to call my sign of x uh, with both real and complex uh, inputs. Now before we forget, we would like this to be acting on arrays, and we'd like this to be pure. So let's put in pure elemental on both of these. Pure elemental on both of these. For motivation, again, pure enables it to be faster uh, because you're promising the compiler that nothing illegal is happening in terms of changing the program state. And Elemental allows you to have the input be array value, or yeah, be arrays of values. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you. So now, let's Uh, try using my sign both on real x's and complex x's dimension array size complex x's So complex x's x index, let's just say x index times 0 0.1 plus a small imaginary part. Um, here, actually, it'll be complex. We'll make the first part the real part and the second part, the imaginary part. And sorry, uh, there's no E in this. This is leftover from when Fortran was old. There might be more modern notation, but you know, you, you get the idea. Complex. And now, we just want to also have complex sine of x's, complex sine of x's. Let's try this. Complex sine of x's equals my sine 
complex x's. Let's try printing it out. Complex sine of x's. Let's try compiling it. I might get an error here. Hmm. Trailing garbage in interface statement, huh? Like <laughs> <laughs> so it's telling me uh, to not name, to not put this here. Um, to not put this my sine of x after the interface. That's what it's telling me to do. So I have to quickly recheck the uh, documentation for interface real quick. Ah, okay. So all I had to change was not put the of x. Let's try this. My sign, all I did was delete the parentheses x. And I clear this up and try that again so that I know. Wow, there's a lot. Symbol my sign already has basic type of real. Okay, let's let's look at this, shall we? Hold on a moment. Um, ah. Okay. I know the issue. I apologize in advance. Uh, but I know the issue now. Let me... Let me try this, and I'll let you know how it goes. I'm going to be deleting the stuff. My sign. Let's see. It's procedure. My sign. Real. My sign. Complex. Let's try this. Okay, it's complaining. Uh... Ah, for some reason, I have led you guys astray because. 
let's let's start over with the interfaces. I want to declare an interface to a function called my sign. I would like to do function overloading with this my sign. I would like for when the user calls my sign of x for them to use either my sign real for when x is real or my sign complex for when x equals complex right so for us to do that we use this procedure my sign real my sign complex here after we write this my sign interface now we have to actually write out this my sign real my sign complex we have to write out these functions so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this my sign to function uh, we'll delete these comments now because once we do it's a really simple function that we can write multiple times and let's just replace the two with my sign real and we'll rewrite this function I'm complex x both my sign and function my sign complex and here we have complex and in x complex my sign and of course my sign equals sine of x let's try this okay that's fine uh, so only one error popped up and that's just because we were in our main function trying to use my sign to so let's make sure we're not doing that anymore and let's make sure we don't try to call my sign too so I'll comment this out okay compile it it works awesome now this test should give us what we want all right so the first line of values is from when we passed in real x variables and the second line is the complex output for when we passed in complex inputs you'll notice the real part is similar that's because we passed in a small imaginary part so there's a small imaginary part and small real part difference but otherwise you know it's the same this is the expected output So I'm going to use uh, Emacs to just compare these side by side. Maybe not. Never mind. <laughs> I'm trying to also use, I'm using the Windows subsystem for Linux right now, and I'm discovering some of the uh, funny some of the funny intricacies of it but yeah so to compare this is our main function and these are the two lines that we were looking at we're using the same function my sign both with comp real and with complex inputs and we got the same output And that was because we declared this interface. 
So that's the basic of how to do, or that, that's the basic way of doing function overloading in Fortran. You can do this not just for functions, but for subroutines. Um, now, this is not all of what interface does, and that's why I was confused earlier. My bad about that. Um, sub the interface command does a few more things. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to get into that today because we've been going for almost two and a half hours. Uh, so is there anything in particular anyone else would like to see that they know about or heard about in Fortran? Um, it's fairly simple to do the generic or the, the function overloading. Um, one of the things I had planned on covering today was writing your own types. Yeah. Yes, Flynn, there is. Um. <laughs> well, here, let's 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 do that let's talk about yeah Lynn Fortran arc <laughs> we haven't gone through reading slash writing from files that's true uh, we probably have time for one or the other okay well, if Jacob can't keep recording, then we should probably call it quits. But we can do a future Fortran seminar where we talk about, yeah, part two. Yeah. We can do that. I could do a part two and, like, we can make actual, like, programs that seem relevant to physics. Okay, so why don't we defer other topics and more complex examples to a part two. Uh, any questions on the content we've covered today? So since we're doing a part two, uh, what we'll cover in the part two is derived types, which are like structs, uh, but you can even, they're more like classes because you can put functions in them. Uh, we'll talk about reading and writing from files, reading and writing to files. And I'll even talk about uh, co-arrays, which is Fortran's inbuilt parallelization. Um, it's new as of Fortran 2008, and it's an easier alternative to using MPI. Uh, So co-arrays, um, 